this day. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for everything. We thank you for our parents. We thank you for this chat room. We thank you for this uh, room that we can share from with our teachers and then the fellows. Father, we seek for your guidance through the Holy Spirit that we may be able to get all the concepts that are going to be shared here and then put them in practice that we may pass our final exams and then put them in a daily life. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name of prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much for volunteering. Okay. Um, some of us have been using this platform a number of times for revision, and you are familiar with what the ground rules are, but there are always newcomers. So, but because they are newcomers, I'll repeat for the benefit of everyone. So what happens here is um, we will have a discussion and at some point I'll ask questions and you are expected to respond to them. You can raise your hand and then we will be picked upon. Then you unmute your mic and then contribute to the discussion. Once you are done with that, with contributing, then you mute your mic again. So if you are not talking, kindly keep your mic muted so that we don't get to hear what's happening in your background because this will disrupt our lesson. And then in case for some reason your mic cannot work well, then you can go in the chat and still make your contributions there. So I'll take time to read them as well. I think that is pretty much the ground rules. So we are going to be having this discussion on Wednesdays. And I look forward to enjoying this discussion with you. So um, let us get started. So um, <clears throat> autotrophic nutrition is one of the major topics in our syllabus. And if you remember from your O level, we studied about the characteristics of all living things. If you recall, uh, very briefly, we created an acronym for them, which we called Mrs. Green or Mrs. Grief for that matter, whereby we had uh, G for growth, R for respiration, uh, E for excretion, um, we had uh, N for nutrition, then M for movement, okay, R for reproduction and S for sensitivity. So Mrs. Griff, M for movement, R for reproduction, S for sensitivity, or uh, that is being able to respond to stimuli, uh, G for growth, R for respiration, E for excretion, and N for nutrition. So this is uh, one of those major topics. And since all living things uh, carry out nutrition, it's very important that we understand how the different living things carry out nutrition. So we are going to begin by looking at what we call autotrophic nutrition. So if I say autotrophic nutrition, it means there must be another kind of nutrition. So um, first of all, yes, Brian, I can see you've raised your hand. Okay, so what are the different kinds of nutrition that we know? I know we are going to discuss autotrophic nutrition, but you should be able to know the other kinds and then be able to know how different they are from each other. 
Do we have any volunteers? Yes. Alvin? We have heterotrophic nutrition. Heterotrophic nutrition, good. Uh, so how many kinds of nutrition do we have? Because you mentioned heterotrophic and uh, I had mentioned autotrophic. Are those the only kinds of nutrition that we have? Yes, uh, Ryan. Uh, those are basically the main are two, autotrophic and heterotrophic, and then the others fall under those two. Okay, good. I needed to be sure that we all get that. Yes, so there are two main forms of nutrition. One is autotrophic nutrition, and the other one is heterotrophic nutrition. Now, what makes autotrophic nutrition different from heterotrophic? How different is it? Just very briefly. Uh, Ryan? Uh, making autotrophic nutrition different is that uh, it involves the synthesis of organic materials themselves other than in heterotrophic. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so when we talk about autotrophic nutrition, these are a form of nutrition carried out by organisms where they make their own food, okay? The food is, of course, organic from simple inorganic materials, okay? Now, on the contrary, heterotrophic nutrition involves organisms depending on other organisms for their food, okay? And then later on, we shall observe that even under autotrophic nutrition, there are two forms of autotrophic nutrition, okay? So in one of the forms of autotrophic nutrition, the source of energy is different from the other. So what are those two forms of autotrophic nutrition? Uh, Brian, you may need to increase your mic in order to hear properly. Or go in a better rece reception zone so that you can hear better. Yes, I can see some people. Uh, Edna? Um, there are uh, the two chemosynthesis and photo photosynthesis. Okay, so what makes chemosynthesis and photosynthesis distinct from each other? Yes, Ryan. Uh, as we hear, uh, photosynthesis requires more of light than chemosynthesis. Uh, as we hear, the word chemo is more of chemical components. Okay, I think we can uh, make that clearer. You're right, but it's not very clear. Who can uh, make it clearer? What, why does he say light and chemicals? What exactly are these light and chemicals? What is their role? in the processes they are involved in. Celeste? Uh, in photosynthesis, the source of energy is light energy, and in chemosynthesis, the source of energy is chemical energy. Okay. Or we could say the source of energy is from the chemical reactions that take place, okay? Yes. Yeah, but in essence, both of them are making their own food both of them are using inorganic materials and they are forming food in form of organic materials. Okay, I think that for the time being will be all for our introduction. So our emphasis is going to be on autotrophic 
uh, photosynthesis, photosyn photosynthesis, some books will call it photoautotrophism, okay, as a way of distinguishing it from chemoautotrophism or what we call chemosynthesis. So we shall look at the other at another opportune time. So let's move ahead. So we have a definition, which I, I believe we are all familiar with, which I've already mentioned. We are using inorganic forms of carbon, that is carbon dioxide, to make complex organic compounds with energy from two sources, okay? So light, that is for photosynthesis and chemicals, uh, that is for chemosynthesis. So when we are using light, we call it photosynthesis. And this process is carried out <clears throat> by all green plants. But remember, photosynthesis also takes place in other organisms other than green plants. What are the other organisms that carry out photosynthesis? Any other organism? Yes, uh, Adrian? Uh, we have uh, the bacteria that synthesize their own food. Hmm. But um, if you leave it at that, it will be partially correct. Your answer seems to mean that all bacteria carry out photosynthesis. How can we improve your answer to make it uh, more valid? I can see more participants. Um, are the same people? Okay, Edna. Um, what if I say photosynthetic bacteria? Is that correct? Yes. Ruth, you have something to say? Yeah, so photosynthetic bacteria is more precise because we have other forms of bacteria. I'm sure you studied about the different nutritional forms of bacteria. And so you're able to appreciate that bacteria literally can have food sources from all, from across the whole spectrum. They can make their own food, but they can also become heterotrophs. They can make their own food using sunlight. They can also, some of them can make their own food using chemical energy. Others are simply heterotrophic. So, Talk about photosynthesis is carried out by all green plants, but also some bacteria known as the photosynthetic bacteria. So we shall begin by studying photosynthesis in green plants. Then at an another opportune time, we shall look at photosynthesis in the bacteria. Okay. All right. Um, So I think I've already talked about this. I hope my slides are clear and everything can be read. All right, so photosynthesis is very important. If it were not important, we'll not waste our time studying it. Why do you think it is important for us to study this process? How does it help me and you or other people around us? Why do we take our time to study this? Does it add value to us? The question is for you to answer. Simon, yes, tell us. Yeah, so photosynthesis is, is useful to us because uh, through photosynthesis, that's the only way uh, plants can manufacture this food. That's the only way energy from the sun can be, can be transformed into food that is edible for humans and is useful to us. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Well, when in biology, we have to look at beyond us humans. We have to look at all other 
organisms, okay? So our answers also need to cater for other organisms. But that was a good answer. Alvin, your hand was up. Photosynthesis helps release oxygen that is used by aerobic organisms. Okay, Joan? Uh, photosynthesis reduces amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, hence reducing the greenhouse effect. Okay. So reducing the greenhouse effect. What else is important about <clears throat> uh, photosynthesis? Can we think of others? Edna? Um, photosynthesis provides a source of complex organic molecules for heterotrophs. heterotrophs. Okay. Yeah, so as you have all rightly said, photosynthesis is the means by which plants are able to harness or to convert sunlight energy into chemical energy which now can be made available to other organisms. So if plants won't carry out photosynthesis, then the food chains as we know them wouldn't exist. So plants have the unique ability to use sunlight energy because sunlight has a lot of energy, convert that energy to join and make bonds in those organic, those organic compounds, compounds such that, such when, that when these organic, organic compounds are eaten by other organisms, they can release energy, which can help them to run their metabolic processes. So it's a very, very important thing. So just imagine if the sun, if we had an eclipse that lasted maybe a month or a week, okay, let's say a month, just as a biologist, try to imagine what would be the impact. Imagine you are in darkness for a whole month, okay? Oh, if all the plants were removed from this planet, so what would happen? So when you have that in mind, it helps you appreciate the role of photosynthesis. Then um, we also see source of complex, as someone said, I think it was Edna. And then lastly, we also see the source of oxygen, okay, for aerobic organisms. So these are the main, not by the only ones, but they are the main reasons why photosynthesis is important to us as living organisms not just us as man, but as living organisms. So we are going to look at the leaf structure. Remember the leaf is the main organ of photosynthesis. It's not the only organ, but it's the main organ. So these are just sections through the leaf. You can observe the major external features which of course from your olive you know how to describe the adaptations of a leaf externally to its function. And then B here we see, a, we shall see a cross section uh, through the leaf, okay? And then here we magnify, we zoom in and see the detail, the ultra structure. So the different layers that make up the leaf. And this is a typical dicot leaf. So if you can see my cursor, we have the upper epidermal layer, and then we have the lower epidermal layer. Then in between them, we have what we call the mesophyll layer, which is divided into the palisade, and then the spongy mesophyll layer. And uh, you can see, the difference in the cells. I'm sure you did learn about histology in plants and you learned about the different kinds of cells. And remember that the shape of the cell dictates the likely function, the shape of the cell. So when you look at this leaf, it has cells which have different shapes. 
And these cells are grouped together to form uh, tissues. So that means that if you have tissues made up of similar cells, that means the tissues are doing more or less the same uh, function. And so when we look at the upper and lower, you notice the cells look alike in orientation and in shape. Then when we look at uh, here, we look at a group of cells that are of same shape and same orientation. Then here we see also cells that look somewhat similar, but they are irregular. And then we notice that they are not packed. They are sparsely, uh, they are rather, they are loosely packed, creating a lot of air spaces in between them, okay? And then we see in another important feature here is the bundle, the vascular bundle. The vascular bundle comprises of these important uh, tissues. On the upper part, we have what we call the xylem. You can even see the shapes, the open, the, 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 the wide lumen. Okay, you can see the shapes of the vessels. Then here we have the cambium, which is between. And then here we have the phloem. Okay, and then interestingly, on the low epidermis, we have a unique kind of cell, this pair of cells we call the guard cells. These guard cells have chlorophyll in them, they have chloroplasts in them, unlike those on the upper epidermis where we don't see any chloroplasts. So by that in itself, it tells us that they serve a very special function. Why is it that they are the only epidermal cells that have chlorophyll in them, and yet the others do not have? Those are points to ponder upon. Then we also notice that the palisade mesophyll cells here have many chloroplasts in them, and the spongy ones have fewer chloroplasts. So with that bit of uh, uh, exposition, I hope we can be able to generate adaptations of the leaf to its function of photosynthesis, okay? That is just a reminder of what we did in all level, okay? But you cannot take it for granted at this level that and think that it's no longer needed. You need to know it as well. So um, can we have um, some quick, like four people telling us separate adaptations as seen in this picture uh, for the photosynthesis in leaves? Any four? People. Yes, Joan. Uh, the Pali said mesophyll cells are densely packed with chloroplasts to uh, to to trap sunlight. Okay, you think you need to add on a little more. So trap sunlight, then what? Uh, which is essential for photosynthesis to take place. Yeah, so to trap much sunlight, which is needed to provide energy for photosynthesis. Good. That's number one. Number, aha, uh -huh, Simon. Simon, you have the floor. Yes, so the cells in the 
spongy mesophyll are loosely packed to create interstomatal spaces for uptake of, ox of oxygen, which is required during the process of photosynthesis. Mm, Simon, I think you need to to restate your 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 answer. You said, let me get this clear. You said they need space for uptake of oxygen for photosynthesis. Oh, sorry, for uh, carbon dioxide, for gaseous exchange, actually. Yes, I think it's better you just say for gaseous exchange. Okay, because when these cells uh, carry out photosynthesis, they produce oxygen, which is a byproduct, which must find its way out, but also let in carbon dioxide. So the two gases are being... Uh, moved in opposite directions. That's why we call it gas exchange. So you find that the carbon dioxide diffuses into the cells because it, it is at a lower concentration since it's being utilized and it's coming from outside the leaf where it is at a higher concentration. And then the oxygen is being manufactured uh, or being given off rather by these leaves and so it's at high concentration in the substomatal spaces. And so it has to diffuse out, hence the gaseous exchange. Thank you, uh, I think it was Simon. Uh, there's someone who has taken OBG6. If it were possible, you put your actual names. I don't want to call people by phone types, but you can unmute and tell us the new. The one who's. Okay. Okay. The presence of silent vessel, which transports water, which is essential during the process of photosynthesis. Okay. Joanne. Uh, I think another point is the upper epidermis is one cell thick and this enables light penetration. Okay. I think we have one more. Remember, these are not the only answers. Let's have uh, Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright, you are getting background noise. Okay, Mr. Wright is not ready. Let's have Techno come back. Techno BG6. Taking on? Um, my answer is the presence of silent vessel which transports water, which is essential for photosynthesis to take place. I think that one you had answered. Oh, you didn't put down your hand. Okay, let's have Olivia. Um, I think the, the chloroplasts within the mesophyll cells can move. <laughs> arrange themselves in the, to the best positions within which a self can absorb light efficiently. Okay, that's correct. Okay, let me take one more person. Um, Isabella. Isabella. Okay, I think they are not ready to talk. Uh, Simon? So another point is uh, the fact that the lower epidermis has guard cells that open and close to enable gaseous exchange. Okay, thank you, Simon. So those are just some of the adaptations. As you are aware, there are many more. OK. 
Okay. So uh, this is just a section through the stomata or the stoma, because it's one, and it's trying to emphasize that unique shape of the guard cells. Remember the inner lining of the guard cells is thickened and less flexible compared to the outer lining where it is thin and flexible. So uh, who can tell us why this is important? Why isn't the guard cell, why aren't the guard cells uniformly thick? Of what importance is this to its functioning? What importance is it? Yes, taking you know. on to, to enable the closing and opening because the inner the inner side is thicker than the outer side, so that the inner side can expand easily when the cell becomes turgid, while the outside while the inner side cannot expand when the cell becomes turgid, but the outside which expands when they take the cell takes in water and closes but when the cell loses water by osmosis it is the outside again which shrinks and then makes the cell to close when it takes in water it opens thank you okay riyad seems like she wants to say something oh i think explanation for this would be in uh, fa okay. whereby they, they relate they give an example of a of a, long, of a, a balloon eh? yes and they put so tape on one side of the balloon. Mm. When you blow air in that balloon, that mm. balloon will expand in form of like a C shape. It won't, let me say the balloon was uh, spherical in a way if you blow air in it without the so tape. But when you add the so tape on one side, it will, when it expands, it will form a bend shape. So that's the case here also. The inner lay, when the inner wall is thicker than the outer wall, it means when it expands to sort of like bend, they are creating an opening in between the two blood cells. Okay, thank you. Well, what happens is that uh, there is differential expansion in the guard cell when it takes when it takes in water by osmosis. So the inner cell is thick and less elastic. And like what uh, Riyadh has said. So when it expands, you'll find that it's going to expand in such a way that a gap is created between the two sides, with the, the two guard cells, the thick layers of the two guard cells, causing the stomata, the stoma to open. And yet the other thinner part will expand much more. So these two guard cells are going to become more uh, C-shaped, if you can put it that way. And when water is lost, of course, um, then they are going to shrink. And when they shrink, they, they got, the stomach is going to, to close. So it's a very important adaptation, even in uh, practicals. I think some of you have had the chance to study the epidermal uh, layer of uh, comelina plant. You must have seen those guard cells. And if you have subjected them to solutions of different concentrations, you must have been able to see them open and then close. And probably you viewed them under the microscope to be able to see that. So it's a very important um, adaptation. All right, so um, that is what they would somewhat look like. Of course, this is an enhanced image with false colors and things like that. Uh, this is still the same of what we were discussing. So um, when we are doing adaptations, 
we must have descriptive words for the different features. For instance, you can say dense network of veins, or you get it, that is describing the veins, okay? Or you can talk about broad, flat lamina. The broadness, or just saying broad lamina is enough to cause a description, okay? You can talk about maybe waxe chutiko. Okay, you can talk about, so such, you have to describe. And then after making that description, then you show us how that description is really important for that process. You describe, for instance, for instance, if you say broad lamina, so providing a large surface area for absorption of much sunlight. If you say dense network of of uh, veins, you can talk about providing much water supply through the xylem and provide and taking away the food through the phloem. You see that? So such words are very important. Okay. If you talk about the spongy mesophyll, you tell us that loosely packed spongy mesophyll cells or densely packed palisade mesophyll cells, okay? Such things. So this is the equation of photosynthesis. I'm not going to take much time on it. I'm sure you know it. And um, these are the adaptations. I'm going to run through very quickly. We have discussed most of them. Now, but what I want to emphasize from our equation when you're describing adaptations, um, we have two raw materials, carbon dioxide and water. And then we have two products. This is glucose, which of course later on is converted into starch and then oxygen, okay? And then we are supposed to have two conditions, sunlight and chlorophyll. Now, when you're describing adaptations for photosynthesis, we are going to look at them threefold. Those that enhance its ability to obtain sunlight, then those that help it to obtain and remove gases by obtaining maybe, here we're talking about carbon dioxide, and then by removal, we are looking at uh, taking out of oxygen. So in what way is a leaf able to ensure that much carbon dioxide enters and much oxygen goes out? To, okay. In what way is the leaf able to ensure that as much sunlight as possible is trapped? Okay. And then we also look at ability to obtain liquids and remove liquids. So the liquids here are water and the mineral salts. And then the liquids that are removed are the photosynthate or what we call the food that has been made by the plant. So this one, uh, of course, comes through the xylem and this one goes out to the phloem. So when you're making adaptations to photosynthesis, these are the major head, head uh, things you should build your adaptations on. Am I describing those that are enhancing light absorption or that, that enhance gaseous exchange or those that enhance uh, removal or bringing in of uh, liquids? So it's very, very um, important. In fact, sometimes the questions that are brought in paper one or even paper two are such that they are more specific. They want you to look at only one aspect, not giving every uh, aspect of the adaptations. Um, someone is telling me plus that equation, who is this? Um, sorry, I had not looked at the side. So, uh, someone wants something on the equation. Taiwan, what do you want about the equation?
Okay, let's continue. All right. Um, this, I'm just going to run through quickly because we have already discussed. Uh, for ensuring that plants obtain much sunlight, the shoot will definitely grow into a, towards the direction of the light, what we call phototropism, okay? So that ability to sense where the light is coming from is important for the plant's survival. Then we have what we call etiolation. Uh, you, you might have uh, observed that if grass is cut and then the dry grass is not collected and left uh, gathered in a heap. When you collect the grass after some days, the, the, the leaves of the, of the grass underneath them tend to become yellow. And uh, that is what we call etiolation. They become long and yellow because they are trying to grow as fast as possible to obtain sunlight. Or if you have observed seedlings, which are in a dark place, they tend to become longer and thinner than seedlings which are exposed to sunlight. So that's what etiolation is about. So it's an adaptation in plants again to ensure that they obtain as much light as possible, as soon as possible, because if they don't, they would die. So those who have understanding biology, that's where some of this content is. Uh, then leaves are arranged in form of a mosaic pattern. You notice that the upper leaves tend to be smaller than the leaves beneath them. That ensures that the upper leaves do not create shadows or shade on the lower leaves and it hinder them from carrying out photosynthesis. So every leaf must have its share of light. So the plant is designed in such a way that no leaf casts a shadow on the leaf beneath it. So the leaves beneath may even have longer petioles so that their lamina can at least, let me maybe try to illustrate this for us to get the concept well. So uh, what happens if, if, if this is our plant, you'll find that the upper leaf has a shorter facial, but the leaf beneath it has a longer facial. So you find that the shadow here of this upper leaf will at least not fall on the lamina of the lower leaf. I want you to take time and observe plants. So that's one of the same. And then you'll find that also, if this is the stem, that if one leaf is here, the one beneath it may be here, and then the one beneath this one may be here, and the one beneath this other one may be, uh, may be in the other direction so that the shadows cast by these different leaves, which are above them, cannot uh, stop those which are beneath them from photosynthesizing. So that's what we call the mosaic uh, arrangement. That's what we call the mosaic arrangement. Okay, let's remove this. Then, um, of course, the surface area, we talked about that. Then they are thin to allow light to pass through. Of course, the cuticle is transparent also to allow light to pass through. Uh, because if it were opaque, it means that the actual centers where photosynthesis takes place would not be receiving the sunlight that they need to carry out photosynthesis. So there must be some uh, transparency. Then uh, this one, one of you mentioned it. They are packed with chloroplasts. 
and arranged in the, along the along axis perpendicular to the surface to trap more sunlight. Uh, another person mentioned that the chloroplast can move. And that's what we call uh, cyclosis. Oh, okay. Then uh, we also have chloroplasts positioned in such a way that um, the chlorophyll is contained within the grana on the sides of a series of unit membranes. And this is going to, of course, allow much trapping of sunlight. Tumwine, you have something to say? Yes, Tumwine. Okay, I'll take it that he has put up his hand in error. So then adaptations for obtaining and removing gases. Uh, these ones, we've mentioned them. If there's something that I post here and it's not so clear, you can uh, let me know either in the chat or raise your hand. This is really stuff we had talked about already. Um, then for removal of liquids and obtaining liquids, we talked about the vascular tissues. Okot is talking about the thinness of the leaf. Yes, Okot. Do you want to understand something on the thinness of the leaf? All right. Um, let's go on. Please let us have um, what well, he was saying. It's another point. Okay, the thinness of a leaf tree is another point because if a leaf is thin, then it will allow a uh, short diffusion distance, which will allow rapid gas exchange, but also it allows easy penetration of what? Of sunlight. Although I hasten to add that uh, the thinness must be coupled with, with transparent, because it can be thin, but in what? Opaque. So the light would still pass through if it was thick and, 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 and transparent compared if it is thin and opaque. So for such points, you need to be very clear in how you explain them, okay? A uh, large midrib, okay, the midrib is basically to, 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 to bring water and mineral salts to the leaf because it branches into the veins. But also if the midrib is big, it means that's probably supporting a very large leaf. So it provides support. Remember that the veins provide a framework, a rigid framework, which holds the lamina in a position to trap much sunlight. So if the, if the, the, the veins were not present, it's like having an umbrella which doesn't have those rods, those metal rods in them. So if the metal rods are not there, the umbrella will not be able to hold. So the midrib, the, the, the midrib and its veins do two major roles. One is transportation of materials, but two, offering a, 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 a rigid framework to allow the leaf to uh, trap much sunlight. So there are those two things. Okay, thank you for your question. 
uh, we can move on. So um, I think this is also clear. So when you're discussing the xylem, please make sure that you attach the relevant function. Don't just say xylem and phloem to transport water and mineral salts and uh, transport food. Whenever you're dealing with transport, there are two very important things. The direction from which things are being transported and where they are going, but also what is being transported. So if you talk about the xylem, what is it transporting? Water and mineral salts. Where is it transporting those things from and where to are they being transported? So it's very, very important for you to do that. Otherwise, it will remain a hanging answer. In biology, a good answer doesn't solicit another question. Okay, so if you keep, there's a question coming after your answer, it means that there's probably something you have not ably explained. So it's very important that your explanation is as complete as possible. Yeah, so this is the point I was talking about. Remember when you studied histology, you we are told about the different types of tissues. You have a scalenchyma, a cholenchyma. And remember, these are usually associated with, um, with these vasicular tissues. So the scalenchyma, remember, are the dead ones. And the cholenchyma are the living tissue. So this scalenchyma usually provide more rigid framework. More rigid framework for them to be able to, to hold the leaf in a good position. Okay, let's see what's in the chat. Austin, your question is not very clear. So I don't know how to respond to it. Please make that clear for me to be able to help you. Okay, if there are no questions on that, I think we can move on. Um, Austin was wondering where is the xylem transporting to? Of course the xylem is transporting water and mineral salts uh, from the stem, remember that the, the xylem moves right from the roots up the stem to the leaves, okay? So the xylem is part of the facial and part of the mid rib and part of the veins. It's like you have a, system, a road network system with a highway which branches into smaller uh, main roads and then the main roads branch into even smaller roads until you reach the village path. So that's the same way we see our leaves. If you were to look at a plant outside, just know that uh, the xylem comes right from the roots. So wherever the xylem uh -huh. is, it is transporting water and mineral salts. So because we are looking at the leaf, the xylem part of the leaf is receiving its water and mineral salts from the stem and bring them into the leaf. I hope that is uh, clearer. Now, uh, we're going to talk about how these plants are able to absorb sunlight, the mechanism of light absorption. Someone once said that plants are like solar panels, okay? Because you know solar panels are able to convert sunlight energy into electrical energy, which light up our homes. So on the, on the other side, the, the plants are also able to convert uh, sunlight energy into chemical energy. So there is what we call transduction. 
But for the solar panels to do that, they are made up of small, uh, what we call photovoltaic cells, those small uh, uh, glass-like cells you see there. They have that unique ability. So in plants, that all happens in the chloroplast. But then how does a chloroplast do that? So for us to understand how the chloroplast does that, we need to first also appreciate the nature of light, okay? So there are three features of light that are very important for, for us to understand photosynthesis. Now, one of them is the spectral quality. Spectral quality, if you remember the word spectrum, a spectrum uh, reminds us of the different uh, colors of light, of white light. Remember, white light is a spectrum of colors. So if you shine white light on a prism, on a glass prism, then it will be dispersed. Is it called dispersed? Or re I think it's dispersed, yes. It will be split into light of different uh, colors, the colors of the rainbow. Okay, red, orange, yellow, um, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So each of those colors is very unique. It has a certain amount of energy in it. Some of those colors uh, have enough energy to cause photosynthesis, whereas others may not have enough energy to cause photosynthesis to take place. And you'll find that the plants have the ability to harness or to, to use those different spectra of light. They are photosynthetic pigments that can use blue light very well. Those same photosynthetic pigments may not be able to use violet light, yet there will be other photosynthetic pigments that can use violet light. There are those which can use red light and so on and so forth. So the spectral quality is very important. Yes, you are receiving sunlight, but of what quality of the sunlight are you receiving? Some sunlight may not be of the right quality to, to drive the process of photosynthesis. Then the intensity of the light is equally important. The light may be there, but may be dim, or it may be bright. Like at noon time, typical noon time in, an, in, in a tropics, if there's, there's no rain, the sun is brightest around that time. And you can imagine the rate of photosynthesis compared to early in the morning at dawn, okay? Or late in the evening at the dusk or twilight. So at the dusk or twilight, the light intensity has really gone down. And at such a time that, yes, there might be light, but it may not be able to do much. So that's why the light intensity is very important. And then lastly, the duration, what we call photo period. How long do you have the light? Is it for a few hours or is it for many hours? Now, Later on in your study, you're going to learn about photoperiodism in plants. Now, this is very important in places that experience the four seasons of the year. For us in Africa, it may not carry much sense, but I'll try to interest you in appreciating photo period. Have you ever noticed that in December, the length of the day and the length of the night are not equal. There are those days when it seems like the sun takes longer to set. It's already 7 p.m., but the sun hasn't set. 
And yet there are days when the sun seems to set very early that it is around 6.45 or 6.30 and it's already becoming dark. How do you explain that? Yes, Austin. Sir, if I may ask. Yes. Is there a standard time for, for the synthesis to take place? The straight answer is no. Meaning that even though, like, and you can say, like, optimum time, like that. No, the straight answer is no. I'll explain to you why. Uh, well, this is a bit of a ahead when you start the, the topic of uh, coordination in plants. We have three types of plants. I'll just talk about that briefly. I'll not go too much into it. We have what we call short day plants, long day plants, and day, day neutral plants. Now, short day plants are those plants that will flower, because remember, flowering is an important aspect of plant life, because from the flowers, you're going to get fruits, and from the fruits, you have seeds, and the seeds will be dispersed, and the plant will be able to propagate its offspring or its genes on a wider space and that is success to the plant. So if a plant can't produce flowers, then it means if that plant dies, that is the end of the story. And if plants didn't produce flowers, it means over a short time, the plants would all become extinct. So what happens is that short day plants require fewer hours of daylight and longer hours of night. Now, there are plants which are Long day plants, those require even longer hours of daylight and shorter hours of night, okay? So you notice that the time, there's no one size fits all that. All plants as we know them must have this number of hours of sunlight. It depends on whether it is short day, long day plant, okay? So, there are certain differences between all the different plants. So there's no one size fits all. But you'll appreciate this when you study photoperiodism under coordination in plants. I think you do that. Uh, you're going to do that certainly in your form six, which you'll be beginning in a few weeks time. All right, um, I think that is clear. Let's move on. Then when we talk about light, this is now a bit of a physics lesson. Uh, light is believed to move in form of waves. Okay. And if you remember from your physics, uh, a wavelength is the distance between one trough, one peak rather, and one trough. So if, for example, we start measuring from here, from this peak, that means we must end on the next peak. So this is what we call a wavelength, okay? So you can find that the light, let me annotate this to bring my point home, may find that some waves are like this. You find they're like this. And then you have other waves that are like this. Now you notice the one I've just drawn above has many peaks and many troughs. So it means it has many wave lengths. This one has few wave lengths. That means this is probably a shorter wave and this one is a longer wave. Then there's another interesting principle is that uh, the wavelength has a relationship with the amount of energy you'll find that on the light spectrum, the, 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 the waves that have shorter lengths tend to have more energy than those that have longer wavelengths. So there's that inverse uh, relationship. And that's why when you look at the light spectrum, I think I have it here, if you look at this light spectrum, rather the electromagnetic spectrum, 
on this side we have 300 uh, nanometers this side we have 800 meaning that we are moving from low wavelength to high wavelength okay and so white light lies within the range of 400 and 700 and if we are to put this white light on a prism it will be split into these colors i think this one you're familiar with and you notice on these colors some of them have shorter wavelength and others have longer wavelength okay and there's a tendency for those that have longer wavelength to have less energy than those that have shorter wavelength, okay? So that's why you'll find that if I had expanded this electromagnetic spectrum, this ends where you have longer, shorter wavelength. You'll find those radiations like gamma rays, X-rays, which are even shorter wavelength and have a lot of energy, enough energy to even denature the DNA and cause mutations. Then on this side, you may have radio waves, microwaves, TV rays, which are generally harmless. So that's why you can be near someone can, you can, the air around you has many waves of different radio stations, but they don't cause you to fall sick because they are of a uh, long wavelength, okay? So we shall come back to this in a little while because what I'm going to discuss about uh, uh, pertains to the different uh, energy available in these different spectra of white light. Okay, something in the chat. Uh, I hope people are not chatting between themselves. I'm seeing, let us please concentrate on what is at hand, okay? Don't distract other people. So this is what uh, we've just looked at and what I was explaining. You see gamma rays, X-rays, UV light, okay? Then white light, infrared, microwaves, radio waves. So these ones are harmless really, but it's these ones that are harmful if misused because X-rays can help us to see broken bones and other things which you cannot see with the naked eyes. UV light can also be used to sterilize things by killing the microorganisms, maybe denaturing them and making them dead. But if you're exposed to it for long, if you expose yourself, then you are in a, you're in for some mutations. So that's why uh, when you go to a hospital and there's a radiography section, they caution you on how to behave around it. And someone is not supposed to be exposed to those waves very frequently and for a long time. So someone is asking about cathode rays. Cathode rays, probably among these, I can't say for sure, but probably among those that uh, have high energy. But your teacher of physics should be able to explain that better. Okay, now this brings me to this. This is now where the gist is. This is one of the things you may find in your papers. Now here we have uh, what we call the absorption spectrum and the action spectrum. These are very important concepts in biology. Uh, what is an absorption spectrum? And what is an action spectrum? Let me hear from you. Absorption spectrum and action spectrum. Now, unfortunately, I cannot say your name because you have named yourself using Chinese characters. So, but you know yourself, you can talk. I think and tell us who you are anyway. My name is Nobat Douglas. Okay, Douglas. I think that the relative rate of photosynthesis is the rate at which it takes place and relative absorption of light is the, 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 the speed at which light is absorbed by the plant. Speed at which is absorbed 
Uh, okay, thank you for your contribution. We shall see how we we bring it in also. Kemigisa, Joy. Um, absorption, absorption spectrum is a graph of relative amounts of light absorbed at different wavelengths by pigment. Mm. And action spectrum is a graph showing the effectiveness of different wavelengths of light in stimulating the process. Okay, this has put it very clearly. I hope we have all heard. So it's a graph, as you can see. And every graph has two variables, two or more variables. So we always have the horizontal or the independent variable, and then the vertical or the dependent variable. So in this case, on the horizontal, we have the spectrum of light, okay? You can see light has different uh, spectra, okay? Here we have indigo, violet, indigo, blue, uh, green, yellow, orange, and red. And if you can remember that on this other mm. side, we have short wavelength, this other side, we have long uh, wavelengths. And therefore, the, 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 the amount of energy, this other side is going to be more and this side is less. Anyhow, so when uh, some scientists um, did some experiment, I think it was Ingelman. Ingelman got uh, spirogyra. We know spirogyra. Spirogyra is uh, filamentous algae. Okay, Sanon, thank you. Uh, it's a uh, uh, filamentous algae. So this filamentous algae, remember, um, is photosynthetic. So if it is exposed to sunlight, it will carve photosynthesis and produce oxygen. Let me just illustrate this again. It will produce oxygen. Now, what this gentleman did was um, to basically get that uh, filamentous algae and then uh, remember it has a spiral chloroplast there if you remember that that sort of thing mm -hmm. spirogyra um, and then they subject it to sunlight and then subject it to sunlight in the water you will see bubbles of oxygen that are being produced so the more bubbles produced, of course, the greater the rate of photosynthesis. The fewer bubbles produced, the less the amount of photosynthesis. So what they did is to get what we call color filters. So you get here and you put there maybe blue light. Maybe this is a filter of blue. And then you expose this blue light because this filter means that only blue light comes to this see to this spirogyra which we have put right there and so it means that light of that amount of energy is received by the chloroplast here then they get another filter maybe indigo then maybe green then maybe orange maybe red so they keep doing that and taking note each time they put a different filter, how much oxygen is produced? See, so if they put a filter and much oxygen is produced, then they say, okay, it means that that light is actually being absorbed by the photosynthetic pigments inside there. And that is why we are having much photosynthesis. Get it? And then, uh, of course, they are able to say, okay, that, that, that absorbed light is actually bring about photosynthesis. So that was the kind of thing they were doing. Then in the next experiment, they were able to do chromatography. Okay, chromatography. When they do chromatography, they get plant leaves and then they separate the pigments there. 
you're able to separate chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, carotenoids, and uh, they also subject yes. them to different uh, light, okay? And they see whether those, uh, that white light is being absorbed, okay? Um, and then they notice if they subject it to light of different uh, spectra, they see which, which, which light is absorbed by chlorophyll A and which one is absorbed by chlorophyll B, which one is absorbed by the carotenoids. So once they did that, they were able to come up with these two graphs. Okay, like Mgisa has already mentioned. So they were able to find that there's a relationship between the light that is absorbed and the light that causes photosynthesis to take place. Okay, so that's what we are seeing in this slide. So they realized that most important are chlorophyll A and B. Because these ones, as you can see, they're able to absorb light, okay? Uh, in the blue and the red region. So you look at the red region, we have chlorophyll uh, B, okay? And then chlorophyll A. You see they're absorbing light in this region. It means that if you subject them to red light, they will use it. They will absorb it and use it and cause much oxygen to be produced. But if you subject them to green light, notice there is no peak around the region where there is green, meaning that that light is not utilized. That light just goes through. That's why leaves appear green because the light of that wavelength is not having sufficient energy to bring about photosynthesis. So it is not absorbed, it is just simply reflected. So when light strikes a surface, okay, it's either reflected or it is absorbed, okay? So when strikes a leaf, part of the light is absorbed, part of it is reflected, okay? And maybe part of it goes through the leaf and reaches down. That's why when you reach in a forest and you look up, there's some light that trickles through to the floor. So light can either be absorbed, can always can either go through or it can be reflected. So when we look at chlorophyll A, it also absorbs at this uh, spectrum, you see? And then chlorophyll B also at this spectrum. Interestingly, we have what we call carotenoids. The carotenoids, for them, they absorb uh, in this spectrum, okay? And uh, you will notice that, you may not notice that there are carotenoids in plant leaves, but you will notice it when the leaves have started uh, dying, they turn yellow. So carotenoids are the ones responsible for that yellow color, the orange color, the red colors, of leaves which are drying up. Or even in fruits, when fruits ripen, they turn from green and become orange, yellow, or any of those other bright colors because of presence of these carotenoids. So the chlorophyll usually is absorbed by the plant and put taken to younger parts eh, which are still growing, or it simply breaks down if the plant does not survive long enough. Yeah, so we are seeing here that green is reflected, thus gives the chlorophyll their characteristic color. Okay, uh, someone is posting here, action spectrum is a graph showing effectiveness of different wavelengths of light stimulating the process being investigated, that's correct. Uh, I think I don't need to add much. Okay, I hope that is clear. So this is a very common area in exams. If you've looked at past paper portions of paper two, they have said this a lot, even paper one. So you'd want to uh, read it because it can easily be said. And by the photosynthesis is one of the common areas that 
questions are said because several experiments have been done on that topic. But besides that, we, we, it, it determines whether we are alive. If we can now to enhance photosynthesis, then we can enhance food production. And then that can cause fewer people to go without food, okay? And that will mean that uh, uh, people's lives will be transformed. So it's a very important topic. So here are some of the photosynthetic pigments. Of course, this one is chlorophyll. Uh, it has that general structure. This is now chemicals of life, if you remember. We have what we call the porphyrin ring. So this porphyrin ring is complex by a mineral known as magnesium. So that's why you hear that uh, magnesium is important for chlorophyll synthesis. When plants don't have magnesium, it means that uh, this ring will not be able to function well. And um, this magnesium, lack of it causes chlorosis. Plant leaves tend to become yellow. And then we have what we call the, 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 the phytol, okay? The phytol tail. So this phytol tail is just a long chain of hydrocarbons, okay? Up to 20 molecules. 20 atoms rather of, um, of carbon can see it's really long. So it's like you have a solar panel, you see this? And then this is like the wire which goes out into the house or something. I like to imagine it that way. So, but anyhow, this is a thing that fixes this thing in the thylakoid membrane. So it fixes it there, but this is the part which traps the sunlight, okay? And uh, this is chlorophyll. So chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B will have very small differences. At your level, you're not expected to know how to draw this. You, you're expected to just be able to describe it. And if you can remember, this porphyrin ring is similar to that of um, hemoglobin, okay? There's a similarity, except that in hemoglobin, here we have iron, okay? And hemoglobin doesn't have this tail, but otherwise they are, they are similar. So, um, so those are the descriptions. So of course, this being hydrocarbon, it means it's hydrophobic. And this one having a bit of nitrogen here and there, and you know from your chemistry, nitrogen has a high electronegativity and high electronegativity is synonymous with hydro, being hydrophilic. So this part is hydrophilic. So it is in the cytosol. It is the one which is exposed to the stroma. Remember the stroma is aqueous in nature. So then this one being hydrophobic is going to be embedded in the phospholipid membrane, okay, which is mostly hydrophobic. So it is there for attachment. Okay. I can see there's some chat here. Uh, why does the chlorophyll A also increase in red light on the graph? Okay, someone is trying to understand the other graph, but the other graph is just basically helping us to know which parts of light are useful. It's not like the chlorophyll increases. If you approach that description that way, it would be hard for you to explain it. The graph, let me just go backwards a little bit. The graph, the graph just helps us to know which parts of light are absorbed and which ones are not absorbed, okay? It's like I place uh, a buffet. A buffet is a series of uh, different types of food before you, and then you choose to eat rice and maybe uh, kalo and maybe beef. And that is it. It's not like that is the only food available. There's more food, but you just don't want it. 
So that's what happens also here with the chlorophyll. The chlorophyll molecule has the ability to only absorb light in this region. And in that region, the rest of the other light isn't. Of course, you may wonder, isn't that a disadvantage? No, of course, God did that uh, bearing in mind that uh, the light that is not utilized by the plants can be utilized by other organisms. Otherwise, if plants were to absorb all the light and reflect none of it, then it would be a, a, a totally different story altogether. So you'll find somewhere in uh, one of the questions, they ask you why photosynthetic bacteria are able to survive when they are beneath seaweeds. Remember both photosynthetic bacteria and the seaweeds require light for photosynthesis. But the simple reason is that the light that is not used by the seaweeds will pass through the, the seaweeds and go to the lower layers and that light will be used by the photosynthetic, by the, 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 the pigments in the bacteria, okay, what we call bacterial chlorophyll and all of them will be able to survive side by side or coexist. So it's God's intelligent design that allows this, okay? I hope I've answered you, okay? Uh, sample questions about the graph. Okay, maybe next time, but if you have a question bank of UNEB, there are many questions of that kind, okay? There are many questions of that kind. But let me see how far we can go. Maybe, God willing, next time, I can just start with a few questions related to what we've covered and then proceed with our lesson. So, God willing, on Wednesday next week, we shall look at a few questions, just like one or two, then proceed with our lesson. All right. Um, so we've just talked about this, sorry. We said that the hydrophobic tail, uh, hydrocarbon tail rather, is hydrophobic and is embedded in the thylakoid membrane. And this one was hydrophilic, lying on the thylakoid membrane surface. And so this is uh, the structure of uh, the carotenoids. Carotenoids is a broader uh, term, but there are many types, okay? And uh, you'll hear of things like xanthophils, okay? But this is basically what they look like. They have two rings on the opposite ends, and then a long unsaturated. Unsaturated means that you have double bonds or multiple bonds for that matter between them. So the long tail, which is unsaturated. Now, later on you'll find, excuse me, later on you'll find that um, these carotenoids are called accessory pigments in the sense that they work together with the primary pigments. The primary pigments being the the, 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 the chlorophylls. So they trap sunlight energy and that sunlight energy is handed or passed on to the chlorophylls. They, 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 they funnel it to the chlorophyll, but they also protect the chlorophyll from what we call a photo oxidation or what we call bleaching. Too much sunlight can be dangerous to the plants. So they are sort of protective. And uh, so that is how they are able to serve a important role. So these carotenoids uh, contain what we call, um, uh, um, getting the pigment, but what is found in uh, vitamin A. Vitamin A, the vitamin A is got from plants that contain this carotene. Okay, and then that carotene, once it is in your body, then the body 
uh, manufactures vitamin A. So they are very, very important. And their colors are usually bright, yellows, they are orange or red. And uh, so the deeper the color, of course, the more double bonds they are. Of course, for most plants, you may not notice that these things are there because the chlorophyll is the dominant color. But if the plant starts, plant leaves start dying, that's when you notice that, oh, there is actually some other pigment. But if you did chromatography, I think that was senior one, and we learned how to, we are, we are taught how to do chromatography, you'll be able to realize that there are actually many pigments. Okay. So they're also found in flowers and fruits. This is just for your consumption. Okay, so we are back at this. So um, this is just trying to emphasize what your colleagues had mentioned, that absorption and action spectra, what they mean. I think I don't need to dwell much on this, unless there's something that's not clear. So it's very important that you know the difference and the relationship. That's what I want us to understand. Absorption is the degree of absorption, just like the word says. When I say degree of absorption, it means that to what extent that light is being absorbed. So that's why you see in some places we have a peak, in other places we have a valley, and in other places we have the absorption reducing. Remember, whenever we describe a graph, we have the rise, we have the peak, then we have the decrease, then we have the, the flatness, so what we call the, the plateau, okay? So when something is rising, let me just, let me just illustrate this. So if we have this, and on our graph we are having something like this, it means that as you move from this wavelength to this wavelength, the absorption is gradually increasing. Okay, right, it's increased, not gradually, it's actually rapidly increasing. Okay, then when you reach at this very point, that's where the maximum absorption is. Then as you go further, the absorption decreases. But when we are describing those graphs, our emphasis is where is the maximum absorption? So we don't describe and say that as light changes from this to this, then the absorption increases rapidly. No, here we are interested in knowing where is the maximum absorption where is the minimum absorption? And then we say where maximum absorption is, it means that that is the most effective light, okay? Or that's the most effective wavelength for that um, uh, pigment, okay? So these descriptions are very unique. They're not like the other graphs you have seen before. Then where we see it is flat, like here, we say that that is the least effective, okay, wavelength of light for that pigment, okay? Then when it comes to uh, action, uh, let me just draw your attention again. You'll notice that the action and absorption spectrum are actually very, very close. If you look here, the action spectrum, okay, which emphasizes the rate of photosynthesis, eh, that is having its peak in the same regions where we have these 
pigments. So it means that the light absorbed by these pigments is actually translated into actual photosynthesis. And we can measure rate of photosynthesis by seeing how much oxygen is produced. So when you have much, um, uh, when, when, when you see, where you see the highest peaks of these uh, pigments is the same place as where we see the maximum rate of photosynthesis. And where we see the least rate of photosynthesis, incidentally, is the same area where these pigments are not absorbing the what? The light. And it's the same time, the same wavelength that we that is green. So it means that the plants appear green because that light is actually not used. It is simply reflected. Then when we go further this side, you notice where we have other peaks is the same instance where we have um, much, much uh, photosynthesis. So from these two graphs, you see that there is a very direct relationship between absorption of sunlight and the rate of photosynthesis. So it's very, very important for you to clearly see that um, relationship. And those are the three main things that you must take from this. If you've not got those, then it means you need to revisit that topic. Are there any questions this far? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then we can proceed still. So what's the nature of photosynthesis? So this I talked about, the raw materials, the main products, and the byproduct. Uh, there's a common misconception on the spelling of byproduct. I want us to get it clearly. When we say byproduct, we mean B Y, then the word product. Rather than B I, B I means two, or B Y E means see you tomorrow, eh? something like that. Bye bye. So this is the actual spelling. We call it a byproduct because it isn't the the intention, the, the plant doesn't intend to produce oxygen. Oxygen comes as a by the way, okay? It's one of the things that are produced as a consequence of the process of photosynthesis, but otherwise it isn't the main reason why plants carry out photosynthesis. So we call it a byproduct and uh, in some books, they will even call it a waste product. So to the plant, oxygen at that point in time is as a waste product. Because as we shall see later, there are some plants that are actually affected by the high concentration of the oxygen that they will even be ineffective in their rate of photosynthesis. So that is something we need to uh, uh, remind ourselves about. Okay. And so photosynthesis is anabolic. Anabolism is um, the process by which, um, anyway, let me not answer that. Let me ask someone to tell us. What is anabolism? Yes, Benjamin. Anabolism is a process by which complex substances are made from simple inorganic substances. Okay, that's right. Uh, Brian, you have a different answer? Okay, so photosynthesis is anabolic. Remember we talk about metabolism, uh, we are referring to the general uh, chemical reactions in the body or in the cell. But this could either be anabolic, that is the ones that result in um, 
synthesis of complex compounds or large compounds from simpler compounds or simpler uh, substances. And then catabolism, as you hear, cata, that is cutting. So they become, start from big and then end up with a small one. So photosynthesis, in this case, becomes anabolic because we are starting with things as simple as carbon dioxide and water. These are very simple molecules and building complex molecules uh, such as starch. Starch, which is made up of many, many thousands of units of glucose, okay? Yeah, so that is something that we need to remind ourselves. And of course it takes place in chloroplasts. So if a cell doesn't have chloroplasts, then it can't photosynthesize. Because remember, chloroplasts contain chlorophyll, chlorophyll which traps the light energy, okay? So a cell which is not having chloroplasts will not photosynthesize. And then, um, of course, here we have a simple uh, illustration. Those are chloroplasts in uh, some plant cells. And then this is another image that was picked from one of the textbooks showing you an individual chloroplast. You can see the stroma, the grana, the thylakoids, and what have you. Yeah. Okay. So the process of photosynthesis we have about 16 minutes. So the process of photosynthesis is a two-stage process. We have the stage that depends on sunlight, okay? Or depends on light. And there's the one that is independent of light. So the one that depends on light, some books call it the light reactions. Others call it the light dependent reactions, others call it the light stage. And then we also have the one which is the light independent stage or the dark stage. Now we call it the dark stage not because it happens at night. No, we call it the dark stage simply because it doesn't require sunlight for it to happen, okay? So I want us to get that clearly. So we have the light stage simply because it is the light dependent or the light requiring stage. And then we have the dark stage because it is the light independent stage or the stage that doesn't require any light for it to occur, okay? So the dark stage can take place anytime, whether there's light or darkness, but the light stage will only happen when there is sunlight. So if there's no light, then it will not happen. And as we shall see later, the light stage happens first, then the dark stage happens next. So if the light stage happens first, it means that there must be something that it's producing that is required in the dark stage. And therefore, I can say that if the light stage doesn't happen, then even the dark stage won't happen either because it has to use some of the products of the light stage as its raw materials for it to take place. So in short, we are saying photosynthesis takes place in two stages, the light stage and the dark stage. So in the light stage, there's a very interesting uh, chemical reaction that occurs. And this chemical reaction involves the splitting of water molecules with sunlight energy, okay? And uh, sunlight is basically important for two things, as we shall see. One of them is the splitting of the water molecules. So when water is split, it is going to uh, dissociate into three products. What are the three products that come from the splitting of water? Okay. 
okay, I'll answer your question in the chat later. Let's first have these people. Um, Ambrose. Okay, uh, the splitting of water, we get uh, hydrogen ions, oxygen, and some electrons. Yes, that's correct. So we get hydrogen ions. So those are protons. Some books will call them protons. That is H with a plus on it. And then we shall get electrons and we shall also get oxygen. Okay, so that is very important. Of course, later on we shall see that the, the fate or the implication of that thing. Uh, someone's asking, those stages have always, those stages always have illustrations. Will I be marked correct if I just use them in a paper other than describing using words? Now, I hope I've understood your question. You will answer the question depending on how it has come. Illustrations in some instances may just be sufficient. In other instances, they may require to simply write. Especially in paper one, where you have limited space, okay? It may not be possible through only illustrations to explain your point. So that's why you need to be familiar with both illustrations and the description of the illustration. And usually when you put illustrations, then you must annotate them. By annotating, it means that you write small notes explaining what the illustration is about. So it's very important that you are able to describe the illustration. So please familiarize yourself with both because in paper one, when they do bring those illustrations, then they accompany them with questions. It's not usual that you are asked to illustrate in paper one using illustrations. Okay, I hope that is clear. All right, let's proceed. So um, when water is split, we call that process photolysis. Photo, because the, 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 there is light involved. And then lysis or, li or, or li okay, photolysis, uh, because there is splitting. So lysis means splitting. So photo, light, lysis, splitting. So light splitting or using light to split water. So we call it photolysis of water or some people call it photolysis. But I prefer to call it lysis to emphasize the, the fact that there is splitting. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. So we have sunlight and we have chlorophyll. So that chlorophyll traps the sunlight and then the sunlight splits the water available. But also we are going to see that this sunlight has an impact on the chlorophyll. Uh, from your chemistry, I hope you have learned about ionization, um, Ionization. What's ionization? You know, it's very important to be able to see the relationship between the chemistry and the biology. It will make some of these biochemical reactions easy to understand. What is ionization? What's ionization energy in chemistry? I think that's inorganic chemistry and physical chemistry. Anybody wants to try out that? Brian, your mic is unmuted. Do you want to answer the question? I think he forgot to mute his mic. Um, what is ionization energy? Or what happens during ionization of an atom? Yes, Benjamin? During ionization, an atom is 
is converted from it is physical normal physical state into gaseous state. Okay, yeah, it what I turn into a gaseous state, but there's something more, and that something more lies within the word itself. Let's hear from uh, Austin. Uh, ionization uh, refers to the minimum energy uh, required to remove from a, from a, a gaseous isolated atom to, yeah, I think that. Let me look for the list. <laughs> well, that is, that's better. You've added on something to Benjamin's. So someone should add, build on that two of your things, Benjamin and Austin. Midian, do you want to answer that? Ionization energy is the minimum amount of energy required to break a mole of gaseous atoms into gaseous ions, into okay. positive gaseous ions. Okay, I think uh, Median has wrapped it up well. So we have a gaseous atom being converted to a gaseous ion. For instance, we have sodium atom being converted into sodium ion, gaseous sodium ion. So sodium atom has zero charge. Sodium ion has positive charge. So what happened is that you removed an electron, okay? You, it left its, uh, uh, it, it was removed from its outermost energy level, something like that. So in biology, we, we, we usually just say that the electrons are excited, okay? They break free from the atom and are excited and go to a higher energy level. Yes, Mukisa? Your hand is up. Mukisa, Daniel? Okay, I think he forgot his hand up. Okay, so um, chlorophyll, just like those atoms you've talked about, when it receives light of sufficient energy, that's the key thing, it will cause excitation of the chlorophyll molecules. So the chlorophyll molecule will lose some electrons from it and they will be taken to high energy level. It's like when you climb up a tree and you reach up in the branches and the wind is blowing, you become very unstable. The next thing you want is to come down as quickly as possible. So you find that you climb up and then you find that you're getting afraid of heights. And when you start coming down, then you start becoming more and more stable. Eh? So what is interesting is that these electrons are going to be excited to a higher energy level. And while they are up there, they have a lot of energy in them. And that energy is what is utilized to cause the whole process of photo of, of uh, the light stages as we shall be able to, to see, okay? Um, I think we have little time. I don't know how much we can cramp in these few minutes. Maybe what we could do is to talk about photophosphorylation in our next session. Uh, we shall look at some questions and discuss photophosphorylation in our next lesson and um, also look at questions pertaining the same. How is that? So right now I'm just going to take questions and then the remaining five minutes, then we will call it a day. Feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, let me first read what's in the chat, then I'll come to you, Median. Okay, someone was just defining ionization energy. Ambrose. Okay, that's fine. Your definition is all right. Uh, Median, can you ask your question or your or your contribution? My my question is on duration, the duration cut of 
in the the duration the other thing you talked about duration that photosynthesis of of a plant is affected by duration mm -hmm. but i i didn't get it clearly as in i don't know how the duration of light can affect oh photosynthesis. okay maybe it didn't come off properly what i was meaning is that for plants to to grow well okay they need to carry out photosynthesis and photosynthesis requires sunlight but then the question is okay when they carry out photosynthesis then they are going to make flowers they are going to produce fruits seeds and what have you and those things don't just happen overnight they take some time you see some plants grow for months now you'll find that some plants will take even much longer because of other factors like how much light they get okay so if a plant is sensitive to how long how much light it gets or how long the period of light it is exposed to then we say that that is a light sensitive plant so it can either be short day or long day plants so such plants usually delay flowering if you don't give them the actual amount of light that they need okay yes they will carry out photosynthesis on a daily but um, there are other plant pigments other than for uh, chlorophylls and rather photosynthetic pigments the other pigments that are necessary for the plant to survive, like what we call phytochromes. Phytochromes are pigments that are sensitive to the duration of light. You get it? So when such a plant is exposed to, say, a short period of light, it will take long to flower if it is a long day plant. It will always carry out its photosynthesis well and good. But if you are a farmer and you are in commercial farming and you are, say, growing flowers and you, and you want to export them or you want to sell them to the market on the season of, say, Valentine or Christmas, and you're not aware of these things, you may see your flowers not, your plants not flowering, and you may think someone has bewitched you, okay? Yet, in reality, is that you are not aware about the needs and requirements of your plant. And therefore, you have not provided them, and so don't expect them to flower. So that's what photoperiodism is all about. And of course, flowering precedes or comes before fruits. And you know that we sometimes plant uh, crops because we want the fruit out of them. So if you planted, say, avocado and then it doesn't produce flowers at the right time and produce fruits, that means you're not doing business. I hope that is clear to you, Median. So photosynthesis takes place all the time, regardless of how much light you have, but it's just that you may make less food if you have less light. Okay? But then other things like flowering may be affected because of the little light. Okay, I can see many things in the chat. Let's take them on one by one. Uh, okay. Does it mean that for the it takes place in the absence of sunlight? Who can help us explain this to our friend here? Some of you are going by the names of your devices. I wish you could rename yourselves so that we don't call you names of phones. I find that very wrong. Yes, Douglas. Oops, I think we have a shot. Yes, let's take Douglas's uh, contribution and then, okay, one more after Douglas and then we shall call it a wrap. 
I think from what I've learned today, you taught us that photosynthesis can take place in presence and in absence of light because there are reactions that require light and there are others that do not require light. So it can take place without light and also with light. But the light reaction has to come first in order for the one that does not require light, light to, take, to take place. Yes. Actually, the last statement you made is what everyone should take note of. That the light, the light requiring reactions must happen before the dark reactions occur. So if the light reactions don't take place, then we can't even say photosynthesis took place. You get it. So indirectly saying photosynthesis requires light because the very first stage that requires light must happen for that. The one that doesn't require light can take place. There was another hand, I think. Isabella, you want to say something? No, sir. Okay. Oh, you wanted to pray for us as we close. Okay, Douglas, you want to say something? No, sir. Okay, so let me give, let me be democratic and ask someone to, to volunteer to pray for us. We thank God for the session we've had and we believe him for a better, for another good session next time. Who wants to pray? Douglas? Okay. So well, Victor has not said anything today. Let's give him a chance. Let us pray. Let us pray. Uh, thank you very much, teacher, for what you have said, and uh, let us pray. Excuse, yeah? Can we pray? Yes. We are getting Lord, we thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for each and every other thing that we have been taught. We thank you for our teacher that you have used to teach us. Lord, it is our prayer that we may grasp each and every other thing that he has taught us and may we be able to present it on paper when required to. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, may you continue to provide for us and uh, increase us in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and we Amen. Amen. Thank you, Victor. And thank you for being uh, able to follow the ground rules. I've not had a lot of background noise. I hope you can maintain that. So we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye. PDF, PDF, PDF. We are, we are finishing. Closing prayer. Report. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Amen. Oh, I'm glad you guys are here. Oh, well, now. Just a script. Amen. 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 Amen.